Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Powerful Voices, How AI is Changing the Game. We're thrilled to have this hot topic on the MerTech agenda. I'm Angela Diffley. I'm the co-founder of the Restaurant Technology Network. For those of you whom I haven't met yet, it's nice to see everybody here in a, a full room here. Uh, this is going to be an exciting and fascinating session. Um, one of my favorite topics in the industry right now certainly is AI. And it kind of came together because um, I met these two gentlemen who are going to be presenting on stage. They're both very entrenched in what's happening in artificial intelligence, particularly when it comes to voice. So uh, Bradley Metrock is the CEO of Project Voice, which you'll hear a little bit more about in just a moment. And John Stein is the executive director of Open Voice Network. Um, they're working to build standardization, uh, which is one of the RTN's favorite terms <laughs> around technology. So uh, with that, I'm going to welcome them to the stage. Um, this is my first uh, MerTech, so this is a super interesting conference. Um, it's, it's fascinating to see the evol evolution going on in your space. Uh, I'll sit down with John Stein, uh, the executive director of the Open Voice Network, um, once we get a little bit deeper into the session, but just sort of want to start off with some slides and use it to fuel fuel the conversation. My name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of Project Voice. We do a number of things to accelerate adoption of conversational AI. So yes, the title of this session is how AI is changing the game, but specifically for this session, we'll be talking about conversational AI, you know, things related to natural language interaction with technology, uh, as opposed to computer vision and some other stuff like that. Project Voice Capital Partners put together uh, what is called the Conversational AI Industry Landscape Map. Um, that's hard to read. <laughs> that's hard to read even on your computer screen. There's a high resolution PDF of this uh, that you can go find on my LinkedIn, you can Google it. Um, there's 400 or so companies represented on that diagram. So um, this was created uh, in large part due to people asking the same questions today that they did four or five years ago. Four or five years ago, it was, well, isn't all this stuff with conversational AI and specifically voice at that point uh, a solved problem? You know, you got Alexa, you got Google Assistant, you got Siri. Uh, isn't it kind of solved at this point? No, tons of companies doing it. Now, well, you got ChatGPT, right? I mean, isn't it kind of solved? Like, uh, no, you got a bunch of companies doing it. So. Tons of companies working on uh, and throughout this ecosystem. I would encourage you to go download this um, and check it out. It'll be of value to you. So <clears throat> within this uh, diagram, within this map, uh, is a specific part um, that has uh, hospitality companies in it. And um, I'm sure we weren't exhaustive. In fact, I know we weren't. Uh, there's new companies every time I look at this. But when you zero in on the hospitality section, uh, there's a number of companies that we have identified um, as doing valuable stuff. And as a uh, disclaimer, I am an advisor to Voiceplug, which is a, an exhibitor here. Um, they're a good company. I would encourage you to go find out, uh, find out why and, you know, if, you're, if you're on the floor. They were part of the startup, part of Mertech, um, really good group. So hospitality is growing. Um, the companies that are working within this, this domain are doing some really good work. Uh, I wanna take just the beginning part of this session and um, sort of frame the discussion. Um, you're not gonna see a lot of metrics in this slide deck. Um, instead, what we wanted to focus on is, is just thinking about how to think about this change. ChatGPT has only been around for the last couple of months, and um, it's captivated uh, our society, our imagination, uh, in ways that very few things manage to do. Uh, I have government officials e e corresponding with us saying, hey, can we get 15 minutes of time we want to talk about ChatGPT? That doesn't happen. We have grandmothers, you know, we hear, see videos of grand, grandparents uh, playing with their grandchildren with ChatGPT. Um, that doesn't happen. So you see all the telltale signs with technology that this is not a fad, 
This is not a gimmick. This is not something ephemeral that'll be gone to, you know, here today and gone tomorrow. That's all the things you're wondering when a new technology shows up. And based on all the evidence we have, that's not the case. So I want to walk through a little bit how we got here, uh, which will frame up the subsequent discussion. So this is the Big Bang visual representation of it. Now you might think this is in reference to ChatGPT. It's not. The Big Bang for this space was this right here. Raise your hand if you remember this. McDonald's buying a print, a print a, if that's pronoun even pronouncing it right, I think it is. Um, so that was about half the room. Uh, the hands were quick. Um, so this was, if you look at the date on the article, September 2019, this was way out in front of the conversations and the discourse going on. There, there was conversations that were ha happening in the rest of the ecosystem. Is voice here to stay? Is Alexa, you know, should we be concerned about it? Or is, are they doing, is Amazon doing the right things? There was a lot of discussion. And then here's McDonald's just simply buying a company. And this changed a lot. Uh, first of all, it was one of the big acquisitions in the space in any industry, okay? But within this particular industry, uh, it validated the entire concept of using AI to supplement operations, to supplement customer service, improve customer service in a lot of situations, um, and to use conversational AI. When I say that, it refers not just to voice, but voice text chat. Um, with a print a, it was primarily oriented around voice um, to, to build upon the, the technology at the, at the restaurant level. So there's three, three steps to how we got here. And this is really what I consider the big bang, what started uh, a lot of the validation that led to where we are, you know, being in this room uh, today. <clears throat> the second, there's a lot of text on this. Um, and I'm happy to distribute the slides later, uh, but uh, the, the text really doesn't matter. This is an article dated um, from 2021, so during the height of the pandemic, talking about, and the headline is, new independent study finds majority of car shoppers open to purchasing online. So the point here is nothing to do with cars, um, but rather the, the reality that the pandemic changed um, everything about how we view buying something. So if you had asked somebody, and I would include myself, if you had if you asked somebody prior to the pandemic, would you buy something, a, a major purchase like a car or a house, sight unseen? Hell no. Prior to the pandemic, you know, prior to the pandemic, that was certainly my attitude. Well, along comes the pandemic and everything's changed and all of our habits, our routines, uh, our processes, and the way that we view things was raised to the ground and deleted and replaced with something else. So step two for how we're all in this room right now is the fact that payments and digital commerce is a book that's being rewritten on a daily basis. Everything about it that existed prior to the pandemic is gone. Yes, are we reverting to some old habits? Yeah, sure but uh, not in aggregate. Um, a lot of what took place during the pandemic is here to stay. So as you're working in the restaurant industry, you know, you have a multi-unit restaurant chain um, and you're thinking about what you ought to be doing, realizing that the way people are buying things is a critical part to thinking about how AI will serve uh, your, your organization. Finally, this is number three. So ChatGPT is here, and raise your hand if you have not used ChatGPT. Oh, oh, okay, we have one? Okay, okay. So, yeah, so <laughs> That's a brave. One. So that's one. A, um, so, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to really put it into words. What this, is, what this has managed to do. Yeah, it's inaccurate, it's got plenty of holes, but <clears throat> um, it's, it's opened our eyes to uh, new ways of engaging with technology. And in terms of how we all got in this room right here, this is step three. 
So ChatGPT arrived 100 million users two months after launch. That's probably a conservative figure. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I can tell you in our space, amidst all the companies working with this technology on a daily basis, it's raised everything to the ground. And you have every company, that list of 400 companies you saw on that map a minute ago, they're all having meetings on top of meetings talking about what is it we need to be doing in response to this other company's technology, okay? So this isn't a restaurant chain where, you know, you kind of see things pop up and you figure out what you want to use. This is a company in the precise exact same space talking about how we need to adapt and adjust everything we're doing to the work of some other startup that just showed up the other day, it seems like, and it's changed everything. So uh, it's, uh, it's strange times. Uh, I took the next two slides from Angela's uh, very well put together resources online from her uh, share group, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, this is just an example of um, so-called generative, generative AI, a term I don't think will be with us that long, it's a separate conversation, being used to create menus for restaurants. So super interesting, it based on, you know, it, it could have been based on some of the generate, generative properties of ChatGPT or something else, but still an interesting example. And then restaurant uses uh, explicitly this time ChatGPT to create recipes for its pizzas. What it came up as incredible, okay. So um, very interesting example of um, proud restaurant entrepreneur uh, using ChatGPT to supplement what that business is already good at. Just some pretty good results. So this is it right here. So voice integration, which really had its big bang moment as far as this space is concerned for sure, back in 2019 with McDonald's buying a printe. Evolution of payments, you can thank the pandemic for that. Generative AI capabilities, um, you can thank ChatGPT for that. Plus labor. So <clears throat> that's the other piece that's a little bit unique to this room. Um, yes, every industry has its own labor issues, but, uh, but the stuff that, that y'all go through, especially anybody who has multiple units up the restaurant chain, um, the stuff you have to think about at scale is just a little bit different than some of the other companies and industries that we interact with. And um, what it does is it create, you add that to the other stuff that I mentioned and you get, everything's new. That's really the point of this presentation. It's really the point of every, it's probably the entire point of this conference is everything is brand new. Um, it, it would be easy for me to sit here and lunch uh, over at uh, Bobby Flay's Burgers, pretty good by the way, um, and uh, just re remarking about how it's the Wild West. Um, it's a, it's, um, there's no playbook for any of this uh, other than, and this, this is an important caveat, other than what's happened in history where we've seen similar sort of reflection points with stuff like the iPhone with stuff like the advent of the World Wide Web, that gives us some idea how this is gonna go. But recently, no, this is all new. So that's, that's really the, the, the driving point of all this. I'm gonna leave you with this, um, and then we'll sit down for the fireside chat component. So um, as you're thinking through <clears throat> the uh, role that AI will play within your business, I think it's instructive to think about the journey we all took as it relates to the pandemic. So if you recall, at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, into 2021, there was talk of a V-shaped recovery. So the concept there was that businesses closed and bad stuff happened, but that we would bounce right back and be a V. We just bounce right back, top of, top of the right side of the V is the same height as the side on the left. We would be just about the same place that we started. Uh, that didn't happen. So then the theory went that we would be in a K-shaped recovery. And this, I think, is true to the point of just being 
axiomatic at this point. What the K-shaped recovery theory says is that <clears throat> if you were on solid ground, um, if you were prospering physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, whatever other way, um, prior to the arrival of COVID, you would continue your ascent upward and to the right. If you were not prospering physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, in any other way, had a difficult relationship that was on the rocks prior to COVID, you know, that thing's over. Um, your business was having trouble prior to COVID, that's over. And if you were on the downward slope prior to COVID, you would continue downward after it. <clears throat> and I have found a lot of personal truth in that. I think it is absolutely correct. It's based in what happened 100 years ago after the Spanish flu. And it's useful to think about AI within this framework because the companies, your competitors, that are embracing AI and finding ways to use it, they're the ones who are gonna be at the top of the K. It's almost by association, companies that are thinking about AI and, and experimenting with it and finding some initial success um, with no further information, you know where they sit. They're at the top of the K. And so your job is to get yourself there if you're not already. And I think that's as instructive of anything I could possibly tell this room <clears throat> full, of, uh, full of veterans. So with that, we'll go to our fireside chat. Let's give a round of applause for John Stein, the executive director of the Open Voice Network. Bradley, and thank you, and thank you for your comments. Appreciate that. So John, take a moment, tell them, tell them who you are. John Stein, Portland, Oregon. Um, 15 years in doing retail as a merchant, taking markdowns, understanding pricing. And then jumped and took a vertical rocket ride to technology and was hired by Intel to create an outreach to the retail, consumer goods, and hospitality industries in 2000. They asked me, can you tell us about the middleware that's extant right now in the technology, in the technology world? I said to my boss, who was a rocket scientist, truly from Rockwell, I said, you know, Tom, I, I know outerware and I know underwear, but I don't know middleware. And he said, you're going to learn. Seven years there, seven years at Cisco Systems in consulting. So I learned chips. I learned the network. Another year, another years at Intel, and then conversations with some leading retailers and others about how do we break down these walls in the voice industry, in conversational AI? How do we figure out, how do we address the issues that can make conversational AI when you're sitting down with your legal departments worthy of their trust, worthy of the user's trust? How, if we have or working and doing voice inside of our organization, and yet there's 98 million users of proprietary voice platforms out there in their homes, how do we break down those walls? If we have seven or eight vendors doing platforms within our stores, how do we get them to talk? And from that, and how many of you heard of Linux Foundation? Raise your hand if you heard of Linux. The Linux Foundation is perhaps the world's leading proprietor and push and really developer of open source technologies and standards. The Open Voice Network was founded several years ago. I'm the executive director. And it was founded as a part of the Linux Foundation dedicated to two things, to break down the walls of technology and ultimately to make conversational AI and voice work like the web, not like apps on a phone, work like the web. And the second was to develop the ethical perspectives and research that when you're sitting down with legal, you're sitting down with compliance, you're sitting down with HR, and you're thinking about using voice or conversational AI, you can look them in the eye because you've been working with an organization like the Open Voice Network, and you know that it's worthy of your trust. 
You know what the issues are. You know what the definition of the issues are. You know the best practices. You know how to implement. That's Bradley. That's what we're doing. I'm John Stein. <clears throat> so, John, talk a little bit about your and the Open Voice Network's intersection with different industry verticals, including the hospitality space um, and some of the groups you interact with and some of the stuff that you're seeing right now. Great question, Bradley. We know that those of us who work in standards and ethical use, it's one thing to draw stuff on whiteboards, it's one thing to have it in an academic setting, but Bradley and Angela has been great in bringing us into and having some conversations with the Restaurant Technology Network. It only matters when it matters to you. It only matters when it helps you do what you need to do, reach more customers, connect, spend less money on integration, spend less money on implementation. It only matters if it matters to you, and that's why we're working on and envisioning what are the use cases that we can help you pursue in quick service and casual dining all throughout the value chain, from taking orders all the way through then the connection with vendors from managing your inventories. We're also working in healthcare, working in retail. We're in conversation right now with a European government who is envisioning using voice to connect all of their citizens, whether it's for driver's licenses or paying taxes, again, for the reasons Let's make voice work like the web. Let's make it work open. Let's make it work interconnected. And let's make it worthy of trust in terms of the data it's used and where it goes. Yeah, I mean, for restaurants, especially multi-unit restaurant chains, you've got situations where, you know, if you've got a, 20, a portfolio of 20 restaurants, um, you're gonna have some performing better than others at every given time, right? And so with voice and some of the voice solutions specifically, you've got um, the ability to ascertain a lot about your customer quickly, just from, oh. from, the, from the engagement with the menu, the, the drive up menu kiosk outside, um, what, you know, the education level, um, deriving socioeconomic status, maybe combining some additional data on top of that. So it's important um, to, uh, to be responsible and ethical with it's, it's hugely, how to think about all it's, that. It's hugely important. Um, gosh, Bradley, you could wind me up on this topic and we'd be here until about tomorrow morning. <laughs> but several things to think about. Artificial intelligence broadly at an academic level is the accelerator of automation. Okay, and automation throughout the value chain. Now think about what's the sustainable value? What's the sustainable advantage for your organization? Ultimately, it's probably when you know sooner, you can decide smarter, and you can act faster. Those three things. Know sooner, decide smarter, act faster. Now voice, to Bradley's point, voice is a remarkable technology and most of us don't realize that voice is like an iceberg where the value is mostly beneath the waterline. It's in the listening. It's what did they say? Who was saying it? Was it a loyal customer or not? Were they happy when they said it or angry when they said it? Now, We've got physicians who sit down and talk to us and tell us while we're discussing this, you know, John, that voice is the second most revealing part of a human experience. Your voice. We can learn more about you from your voice short of DNA. Give me a couple minutes of your voice and the right language models and the right databases, I can tell an awful lot about you. Now that puts a huge responsibility, Bradley, as you're suggesting, on your shoulders. Voice for automation, voice for knowledge, voice for speed. 
voice for connecting to the 98 million you're not talking to right now. But it's a huge responsibility. And the use of voice, it's not something to be frightened of. It's something to be, Bradley used the right phrase, it's being respectful of. Being respectful of data, being respectful of voice data. Bradley, you're spot on. Um, John, the, uh, we were talking earlier, you know, there's a lot of vendors here. There's, uh, you know, I mentioned voice plug, shameless plug, I'll probably mention them again. Um, Soundhound, Converse Now, a bunch great, of different great types firms. of companies. Great firms. Yeah, great they're people. all great. Um, in the slides, there's no discussion on this one. This one's technology stack, understand speech recognition, 98%. Converse Now recognizes 98% of the words, and Soundhound is only 95. And Soundhound is, uh, but you know, 50, 52% less than voice plug. There's none of that. And the reason, the reason there's none of that is because the feeling is, and you, you tell me what you think, that the idea behind where we are with AI and conversational AI right now is that it's far more valuable finding a partner that you trust than doing a whole bunch of forensics on, are we gonna save a couple of coins with this one over that one? It's rather finding that long-term partnership that you can grow with and trust between you, and then also you know, sharing some of the standards that groups like yours come up with. I, I couldn't agree more. And the selection of vendors, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. And the easy thing, and again, I come from Intel. I come from Cisco. At Intel, you talk to vendors, and you'd have a bunch of CPU forensic you know, scientists examining every little eighth of an inch, or even more, hell. Voice performance, Bradley, to your point has advanced to the point where the technologies generally, no exceptions, are generally going to work. They're going to do what you need. It's in the, let's solve the softer skills. What's the integration? How much integration are they going to charge you because they're not interested in interoperability? I had one company come to me and say, no, we don't want to do the open voice network because we make all our money on custom integration. Now, you're the ones paying for that. How do you, what is your level of trust? What is your level of extensibility? What is your level of long-term play? All that comes into account in making those right decisions. Um, lots of great companies, lots of great companies, great people who will do you well, but be looking and asking beyond, to your point, the technology questions. So I'll ask you one more question, then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. This looks like a, a, a group we might get some good questions from. If not, I'll just keep on asking your questions. Um, but uh, ethics. So whether it's chat-oriented, like ChatGPT, there's been a ton of ethics-related questions in the media. Some related to education. Uh, are we screwing that up for our kids? Um, some related to, as always, where the data came from that backs all of this. Um, are we representing uh, the world as we should be representing it with the training data and so on? There's a bunch of different ethical questions, not just with voice, but with other modalities, chat text. Uh, tell the group how Open Voice Network and you specifically think about navigating that and, and what words of advice would you have for this room? There's, again, Bradley, shut me down here mm. if, if I talk too long. Big issue, damn right. But there are a handful of principles that have been informing the thinking about artificial intelligence and ethics over the past 10, 15, 20 years. This is not a new topic. It's been brought to the surface even more because of ChatGPT, and properly so. The Open Voice Network is going to be soon initiating, in fact, end of this month, 
um, tune into the webinar, check it out. Um, something called the Trustmark Initiative, and that's a working title. And what that is, is as we look, is applying all that knowledge of the ethics, transparency, consent, accountability, understanding and acknowledging and respecting that there's a human behind every AI decision. This stuff doesn't come from the sky. There are individuals like us doing this. And so putting together this initiative, which will be a series of educational programs your employees can take, as well as then if a checklist, a self-assessment checklist, hey, how are we doing on this? How are we handling data? How are we handling consent? How are we handling accountability? How are we doing the things we need to do? and that Trustmark initiative coming out again to provide guidance for an industry that we all need it. We all need it in taking a look at this as we work with this very, this critically important, essential technology. So we'll open it up for questions. Uh, before we do, I'll tell a quick story um, that sort of underscores why the work that John and the Open Voice Network is so important, and it just relates to technology and data. So um, it was about 10, 10 to 15 years ago. I, t I tell the story a bunch. Not, not every detail may be correct. It'll be mostly correct. So about 10 to 15 years ago, um, a major retailer based in Minneapolis that you probably know um, had an analyst uh, that was working there. And uh, this analyst uh, figured something out. He figured out that uh, <coughs> customers that bought uh, five or six items from a list of about 13 to 14 items uh, were within a 90, 95% confidence interval pregnant. <clears throat> and he told the people in, uh, you know, his, his executives and, and managers this, and they're like, all right, let's run with this and see what we can do with it. And uh, what ended up happening is, so they started tracking this at the store level, and there was a story that came out, no one knew any of this until there was a story in the media that came out where uh, this gentleman in the Midwest, you know, Kansas or something, um, started getting these mailers from Target saying, um, uh, you know, here's your, here's your pregnancy discount. <laughs> and this guy's like a farmer and he, he really took umbrage to this, but, but he did have a 15 year old daughter <clears throat> and uh, and he kept getting these. He kept throwing them away. Finally, he called up. Tar he called Target, and he said, "How did I get on this list?" And they said, "Oh, well, we, you know, routinely study the things that you buy in the store, and we send things you think are helpful." And of course, this is some customer support person saying this, not a manager. So uh, a couple weeks go by, and he continues to get these things. Finally, he finds out that his daughter is indeed pregnant. And uh, the, that's how good the analysis was inside the organization based on technology and all the tools that they have at their disposal. They knew about you way before you knew about you. And I always think about that story, especially in context with the great work that John and Open Voice Network is doing, and especially in regards to where we are today there was no chat GPT, there's no generative AI, which is just our fancy code words for the AI. It gets a little bit from you and it does the whole freaking rest of it. Um, we didn't have any of that back then. So it's, it's uh, you, you got two longtime technology folks, just like everyone else in this room, who are scared of what the prospective future looks like just as much as everybody else. So um, that story usually is instructive. I enjoy telling that. It's, um, it's, it's halfway useful, but uh, we appreciate all y'all being here. Happy to take questions. Uh, fire away with anything ranging from chat GPT to uh, voice in restaurants and what, what, what's on your mind? Don't be shy.
Um, with the uh, number of AI-infused companies that are coming out for restaurants specifically, um, I'm getting hit up, you know, really frequently, and I, you know, end up making a like a like a PowerPoint presentation of all the differences between them. But it's getting hard to tell the difference. Like, and you mentioned a couple like uh, Converse Now and uh, Kia, and, and we use some others. I'm curious, besides price, how are you evaluating? How are you doing the like a comparison amongst the like the new people with all the new tools that are scaling up versus the people who've been doing it for even which in AI two years is a long time at this point. How are you doing that initial like you know cut? You want to take this? You want, you want me to? You want me I'll to give a shot at it, and then I will. There's a couple individuals in this room who have been at this for several years. So I look to experience. I also look to how have they created value? Because it's one thing to talk technology. It's another thing to apply technology to business process and create sustainable, measurable, incremental new value. Have they done that? You know, again, there's gonna be a lot of people waving their arms, saying, I've, I can do large language models, look at me, I've got generative AI, ba 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 I know I'd be interested in someone who last year, last year, was creating value, and that value has scaled. I want to talk to you. Yeah, um, so on the VC side, we're constantly interacting with companies looking to raise, right? And it's in that context where you need to be telling the story of how you're better than everybody else. You know, we want, um, that's not the time to be bashful, you know? And yet, <clears throat> in those situations, um, and this is something I've written about, the, the, not just in this area, hospitality and the restaurant space, but in many others, the, the lack of comparative metrics is awful. And so you get situations like, um, you know, there's a big company in the auto space that spun out of Nuance, and every presentation I see out of there, I like them a lot, but every presentation I see of theirs, they're, talking, they're comparing their, themselves to other competitors by customer satisfaction, which, is, you know, not that they bother to tell you what they mean by that, but not that I would care anyway, because that's not nearly in depth enough you know, to try to make a, you know, make a decision on who's better. And so to your question is, how do, you, how do you size up this constant flow of inbound communications? And similar to John, I, I, if I were you, um, I, I, you know, I'm looking for, like I said earlier, I'm looking for someone I can trust and grow with, because I can spin the numbers any way I want. So for some people, that would be maybe somebody out of your geographic region um, who understands that market. Maybe it's somebody who has done great work with a competitor and you liked what you saw there and you think they don't suck because of that. Maybe it's somebody who's been around and there's one of them in this room, a company that's uh, done some work more generally across the voice space that now is diving deep on restaurants and that's a particular value to you and that's who you want to ride with. Um, you know, there's a lot of things. It, None of these companies, these companies are gonna have trouble answering the question to a way that's gonna satisfy you with some, like some other more mature technologies would. So you're just gonna to have to unfortunately rely on more gut feel um, and someone who can grow with you as both of you understand the impacts of the technology more moving forward. Bradley, I'd add one more thing, because that's a, your question is a great one. Do they get you? Do they understand your pain point? Do they know your vocabulary? Do they know your processes? Are they coming in selling technology or are they coming in to provide you an advantage? It's a big difference. Yeah, because with voice specifically, it's, all, it's, it's very innately human, right? So as I often will say, vo you know, when we're born, all we have is our mother's voice and before we're born, and then we go on and develop an inner voice that lasts the rest of our life. So voice is uh, distinctly and innately human. 
And so you need people who understand, you know, sort of the humanity of your customer base to work with you, much more important than however somebody spends, you know, a stat or something like that. Thanks for the question. Hi. Oh. Yeah, two, two questions. One, um, you, you talked a lot about the, the application of, of conversational AI from a customer perspective, but what use cases are you seeing in terms of driving efficiency in restaurant operations? Um, and second one is, is the, the application of this across a um, multi-language and multi-country um, perspective and, and how much more complicated is it when you're trying to, to do that geographically across the globe? <clears throat> I'll, I'll start with this. You good with go, ahead, go ahead. Um, your second question was about geographies and different languages and stuff. Fortunately, that's a, that's a question that's getting resolved shockingly quickly. So there's a company that um, is called Sonus. They're on the map. I'm not sure where. They're there, though. Sonus, S-A-N-A-S dot A-I. So they, they have been very controversial. They've been in the news a bunch. Um, I've had to talk to, them, talk to them and about them a bunch. They are, they are controversial because they have software, they, their AI de-accents you. So if you are a uh, Indian male um, that speaks with a thick accent native to that part of the world, um, it will delete that and it will make you sound however it is that the customer, you know, the, the management of whatever business it is wants you to sound, which is, in many cases, white, which has led them to be in the news negatively. But um, they're on the cutting edge of that, but there's a whole raft of companies that are basically raising to the ground all of the different challenges associated with being in different geographies, not just with language and translation, but other stuff too. And so the answer to the second part of your question is, not, it's not nearly as much of an issue um, as, uh, as you might think. The first part of your question was use cases? Well, it was use cases use, use cases for conversational AI in almost restaurant operations. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, oh, no, no, I'll no, say ahead. this real quick. Uh, so there, um, there's some real interesting stuff going on. There, uh, one of the things um, that I was following before the pandemic was there was a, there's a company that uh, with uh, he um, headed up by a longtime restaurant technology entrepreneur named Mike Atkinson that um, is basically applying voice oriented AI to inventory management in the restaurant. So apparently keeping, you know, um, keeping up with inventory, alcohol, and everything else is, is challenging. It's um, trying on the staff um, even before the labor disruptions of the pandemic came along and being able to integrate. This is just one example of several. I mean, I can give you all stuff all day on this, but uh, this one is just kind of interesting where you can use um, voice, and now there's some chat and some other modalities integrated into it, but essentially voice AI to reduce the legwork associated with keeping that inventory current um, by, according to his numbers, 80%. So it's super interesting. But anyway, John, go ahead. You're the expert, I'm not. And all of you are far more knowledgeable to answer that very good question than I am. But I'll tell you what we're exploring and asking on a whiteboard is as to translate orders into workflows and from those workflows then the analysis of what then can and should be on the menu and then also the analysis and then translating that moving that data without touching it moving that data then to inventory requests and management those are the things we're looking at. But again, you're closer to it. You know what's possible and not. But those are the things we're looking at. Any other one in the back? Hopefully that was helpful. I feel like the people in the talk shows. <laughs> Does voice AI have the ability to have order confirmation 
through voice AI so that personalized recommendations can be made from voice recognition in uh, an API forum from order confirmation. Could you repeat that just so we give us time? So let that order sink. confirmation and voice AI and order confirmation from the POS systems are two different things right now. Does voice AI also have the ability to feed a personalized recommendation system so that personalized recommendations can be taken from in the cart based on co-occurrence Sorry, I'm a data scientist. From um, the order through voice AI, so that personalized recommendations can be then presented in real time on the screen. So you're you're asking, can voice AI know it's you by the sound of your voice? Okay. I'm asking if I order three things: a cheeseburger, a fry, and a coke. Does voice AI, can it take that order confirmation of a cheeseburger, fry, and a Coke, send it to a third party so that I can do in a, another machine learning AI application that predict what will either make me more profitable, more sales, or if I'm selling gift cards, sell gift cards, to be able to take that recommendation and personalize it so that on the same screen through the drive-through, I have the ability to then recommend what I'm trying to nudge the customer to do. Yeah, so um, yeah, the short, short answer is yes, it can, but it goes beyond that, right? So you're asking just on the basis of the three, you know, on the basis of the individual components of the order, can we predict other things that might easily be attached to the order, right? I'm not asking you to predict that. I'm asking you, can you give the data to something else that can predict that? Yeah. I'm trying to architect that in a whiteboard in my head, and I think the answer is yes, but I'm, again, that's, the whiteboard is not necessarily, I may not have all the dependencies and the questions and the things that you raised, but I think think it could be doable, but there are very smart people in this room who may disagree with me. But I think it's possible. Doable? How many, how many doables? Raise your hand if you think it's doable. <laughs> there you go. Um, thanks for all the input, guys. It's really inspiring. Um, I think the question everybody's asking is which which voice AI or which AI? And like AI is like a shiny little toy, in the, you know, over here. It's uh, everyone's popping up. I think the question we ask ourselves, and I have to confess, I'm a little startup called Oweater that does texting AI order and service requests, is what happens when AI fails? Because it's so new. Like, what happens when it only gets it right 60% of the time? As these gentlemen said, pick the people that you really like. And what we've seen is you have to come up with such a contingency plan to make sure that that customer's not getting frustrated with your chatbot loop, not getting frustrated at the order, and that you've thought of it while AI evolves, which is gonna happen so fast. Um, but and like everybody's on the floor talking about ChatGPT, right? There's DaVinci, there's all these, the pro. It's gonna, Google's gonna come out. There's gonna be more. So it's like when you get into bed with a company that's doing AI, you really have to say, what's the backup plan for now? And then bet on the long term that these people understand your hospitality needs and are going to be able to evolve. Because two years as a company, like that's nothing, right? When you're dealing with a 100-year-old food brand. So that, that really touches on the whole K concept I was, that, that I ended the slides with. Because... While you're going to have less humans involved, ultimately, the humans that remain involved are the best of the best, and their, their importance to you is now significantly higher than what it was. Because uh, the training, you know, the, 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 the thought processes and the things that you have to deal with that are contingencies based on dealing with the AI system that's there are different than what you had before. So now there's more weight on their capable shoulders. So the people who are at the top of that 
you know, are critical to your organization and you'll have to figure out how to retain them. Meanwhile, you know, there's a lot of people that, that no longer have a place. So that's, that's, you know, what I think of when you sort of describe that. I think the, you raise a really important point. You know, we all read ChatGPT. Note how many have been asked by senior management to explain ChatGPT and when will we have that in our company? <laughs> yeah, more than a few. And what it's done, yet again, has raised the unrealistic expectations of what artificial intelligence can do and what, indeed, conversational AI can do. We expect it to be human to answer our questions and be accurate. We expect it to be human. We anthropomorphize this. I think that's the term. If it can only do 60% in your tests, by God, you're not going to implement it. And yet there are going to be senior managers who say, we've got to do AI, so by God, please make sure this thing is in there. So it is a man, the, expect, the management of the hype that is, we had a, just had a sonic boom, right? It's still ringing in our ears. It's gonna be ringing in our ears for the next six to nine months. Managing that is critical for all of us in IT and in IT implementation, and in IT implementation that must be reliable, scalable, extensible, reliable, 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 right? It's okay that it's not ChatGPT. And for God's sakes, most of you will be using domain-specific limited language models. You won't be using ChatGPT. So again, we're all together, with Angela's help with Bradley's leadership, we'll be managing this. And it's managing and dampening expectations as much as anything else. Uh -huh.